a friend of mine uh, likes to begin our conversation with uh, this question. He says, I got some good news and some bad news. What do you want to hear first? And in response, I wanted to hear, uh, I want, sorry, I wanted to make the bad news less bad and the good news sweeter. I say, naturally, give me the bad news first. Well, when it comes to the gospel, which means good news, in order for the good news of the gospel to be understood, appreciated, and desired, the bad news must come first. And that is the main idea of my sermon for today. The bad news must come first before the good news, which is the gospel. And the gospel is encapsulated in Jesus' life, his death and his resurrection. His life, death, and resurrection. So you might ask, why the bad news first? The bad news sets the context for need for the good news. It prepares us for the gospel. Bad news whets our appetites so that we are famished for the gospel. Therefore, I as the preacher shouldn't start feeding you the gospel right away. I must first set the table. I must place uh, the, the tablecloth and the silverware first. I must set, arrange the forks, the, the spoons and the knives so that you, the supper guests, will uh, anticipate and feast on the good news. In my illustration, the tablecloth, uh, tablecloth and the cutlery represent the law. The bad news. Why is the law bad news? Now, don't get me wrong. The law isn't bad. No. It just happens to be bad news for us because it is the standard by which God will judge us. And we all fail to meet the standard. And that is what sin is. Sin means missing the mark. Thus, the law, or the Ten Commandments, is a tool that emphatically shouts bad news at us. In Romans 7.13, it states, It was sin in order for that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through the law, which is good, that through the commandments, sin might become utterly sinful. So the Ten Commandment teaches us what sin is, and the law used properly convicts us of our sin. The Ten Commandment is like a mirror that wakes us up from our delusion. Uh, before I go and take a look at the mirror in the morning, uh, I might think I have a clean face. But uh, the mirror, when I look at the mirror, it reveals the, the dirt and the grime I have on my face. Uh, I might think I have good skin, but then when I look closely in the mirror, it reveals the acne I have all over my face. Uh, I might think I have neat... Um, tidy hair, but when I take a look in the mirror, it reveals to me the messy hair that I have. It shows sometimes my deep wrinkles. Uh, in fact, a couple of days ago, while I was looking in the mirror, uh, to my horror, I discovered I had a couple of gray hair. Uh, the, the, reve uh, sorry, the mirror reveals painful truth. And uh, we are forced to admit that we have blemishes through the mirror. We have flaws. The Ten Commandments, in the same way, acts as a mirror does. It soberly exposes our state, our sinful state. But sin is much more serious than a bad hair day or uh, a couple of gray hairs. Okay? Because sin kills. Now let me ask you a serious question. Have you ever gone face to face like you look in a mirror, have you ever gone face to face with the Ten Commandments? Have you ever gone through every single commandment and asked yourself this question, have I obeyed throughout my entire life the Ten Commandments faithfully in thought, word, and deed, in, uh, outwardly as well as inwardly? To see if we pass a test, let's go face to face with God's law. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever loved anything in this world more than God? Uh, be honest. Uh, I bet you have. 
Okay? Uh, if you have, you have already broken the Ten Commandments. And according to the Bible, you are an idolater. Have you ever hated or rebelled against God in your life? Yes? Then you are an enemy of God. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? If so, you have broken the Fifth Commandment. Have you ever hated anyone? If so, according to the Bible, you are a murderer. Have you ever lusted after someone? You know, you looked at a woman or a man, uh, and you're like, oh, he, she's so beautiful, or he, he's so handsome, I want that person. Yes? Then according to Jesus, you are an adulterer at heart. Have you ever stolen anything in your lifetime? You are a thief. Have you ever lied to anyone or deceived anyone? You are a liar. Have you ever been jealous of someone or desired something that belonged to someone else? I think we all have. And if we are honest, we will all admit we are guilty of failing to keep God's law perfectly. Through the unbearable, potent light of the law, we are shamefully exposed in front of a holy and righteous God. Romans 3 says this, The law speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may be accountable to God, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. As the law condemns us, it painfully and forcefully exposes not just the individual sins that we have, but also our sinful state. And sadly, the product of our sinfulness is death. Beloved, this is more serious than terminal cancer. Because God is a God who is just, He is our judge, and He will punish the guilty. As is said in Romans 4.15, the law brings about wrath, and it's a just wrath. We deserve this wrath. As Paul admits in Romans, that in his flesh, nothing good dwells in him. As a result of the sin that dwells in him, he is a hopeless and wretched man. He is a prisoner of the law of sin. This helpless and hopeless state doesn't just apply to Paul alone. We are all in this wretched state together. From Hitler to Mother Teresa, we are all in the same boat. This boat that is sinking fast into the judgment waters of God's righteous wrath. Unfortunately, many people, including professing Christians, fail to understand this. They self-righteously believe that they are good. In them, there is little sense of alarm or disgust or even remorse because they have failed to use the law properly. They are blinded of their true spiritual condition. Much like the self-righteous Pharisees, they have lowered the bar of the Ten Commandments to their personal height, whereas Jesus raises the bar to the height of God's holiness, perfection, and righteousness. In Mark 10, verse 18, Jesus says, No one is good except God alone. In Psalm 143, uh, 143 verse 2, it states, No one is righteous before you. In fact, Revelation 15.4 says, Only God is holy. At the same time, Romans 7.12 says, The law, the commandments, are holy as well. Now, is there a contradiction? Can God alone be holy as well as the Ten Commandments, the law? Is that a contradiction? Uh, no, the Ten Commandments reveals the character of God. Do you remember how the Israelites received the Ten Commandments? When the Israelites were in the, were in the desert, Moses went up to the peak of Mount Sinai as the Israelites waited at the base of Mount Sinai. And God met Moses at the peak of Mount Sinai, and he gave, uh, God gave Moses two tablets of stone, and on the two tablets of stone was written the Ten Commandments. God wrote with his finger on the Ten Commandments. His uh, DNA, if you will, his righteous, holy DNA, if you will, was embedded was smeared into the Ten Commandments. And that's why the Ten Commandments, the law, is holy 